Thank you, Dr. Edwards, for that wonderful prelude this morning. Uh, good morning. Glad to welcome each one of you to our worship service today. We're so pleased to uh, have so many with us here in the sanctuary and also uh, those of you who are uh, watching by Facebook or YouTube uh, or maybe uh, pulled up outside the church listening on the radio. However, you're picking up our time together. We're so glad that you are doing so and we trust that you will experience the presence of God uh, in these next few moments. Uh, there are just a few announcements that I would uh, touch base on, uh, call your attention to. The details you'll find there in your bulletin. Uh, of course, as always, this Wednesday we'll be having <coughs> our uh, contemporary service at 6 o'clock uh, here in the sanctuary. Uh, and immediately following worship today, uh, a very brief meeting of those that are going to be helping with our children's worship. Uh, that will be, I guess, y'all going to meet like right over here front of the piano that, that'll be a, that'll be a good spot y'all gather up that way i'll have a, a very quick uh, informational kind of uh, meeting there uh, and also a reminder to our deacon group that we'll have uh, another meeting as well immediately following that meeting uh, and then we'll have uh, time to go home and eat so two meetings worship two meetings and then you can go home uh, so we hope that you'll uh, if that applies to you uh, that you'll be able to uh, attend all of those then uh, next sunday uh, we are moving our worship time back to 11 o'clock, the, the holy hour, uh, that's the way that it is, the way God, way God intended, 11 o'clock, uh, and uh, we'll be here in the sanctuary just as usual, and uh, we'll have our, uh, invite our children to come down to the front, we'll have our children's uh, moments there with them, and then they will go back and have children's worship. Uh, so we are looking forward to uh, next Sunday. Uh, see, I've got a big, big row of, of uh, children back there on the back row right now. We're looking forward to next week. And also, our young people will be uh, helping with that, our youth. And so, uh, we're lo really looking uh, forward uh, to, to their participation as well in, in helping, uh, helping with this. But that's next Sunday at 11 o'clock. Get here at 9.30. You'll be able to get a front seat and not have to worry about it, but you'll have to wait for about an hour and a half before, the, uh, before everything kicks off. Uh, as you look in your bulletin, there's a little insert there regarding a drive-by bridal shower for uh, Logan and uh, Elkins and Alex Britt. Uh, if you make note of that and uh, take that opportunity on March the 21st. And then also uh, those of you who uh, give blood or those of you who are anticipating uh, possibly starting to give blood, we'll have a blood drive here uh, in our fellowship hall on April the 8th. Uh, that's April the 8th. There's information in there, numbers that you can call uh, if you need any further information uh, on that uh, very important uh, issue. Now, those are all the announcements we'll call your attention to. We hope you'll take time to read through the rest of those things that are in your bulletin, our church newsletter, other places for information. But let's begin our worship <coughs> with hearing the word of the Lord. Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. Psalm 22, 23 through 31. <clears throat> you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring it to a people yet unborn. He has done it. May the Lord bless those words to each of our hearts and lives today. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Eternal God, we thank you this morning for the wor opportunity for worship and the freedom that we have to be among our family meeting together in this place in so many different ways. 
Yet, Lord, however we are here, we pray that you would give us the ability to feel the warmth of your embrace. We thank you that in this time of worship, we can come and put aside the uncertainties of this world and rest upon the certainties, the promises of the truth of your kingdom, things that will not change throughout all eternity. We thank you as well, Lord, that we can come as we are, bringing and laying at your feet all the hurts and fears and trouble that fill our lives and leave them there, knowing that your strength and assurance are all that we require. We thank you that as we are here in worship, we are transported from this place of concern and fear into a place of peace in your presence. Lord, we pray that we would all find healing and wholeness and refreshment in this wonderful opportunity of worship. Amen. We've set aside these moments uh, to spend a few moments with our children. Uh, if you are uh, not here with us and you're at home and you've had opportunity to uh, receive your little mail out this week, we uh, hope that that has been helpful. Uh, but this morning I want to talk to you about some things that I like to do. What do y'all like to do? What have I got in my hand? Y'all can holler out from back there. That'll be fine. What is it? Fishing rod. That's exactly right. What do you do with this? You fish, that's right, you go fishing, have a good time. Uh, in fact, I, I, I enjoy fishing, but I, I could have brought a number of things. I could have brought my golf clubs, I could have brought my, uh, my, my little TV gaming thing. Uh, there's all kinds, what do y'all like to do? What do you like to do? I can't see through the mask. Play with your baby brother, okay, that must be Graceland back there. Any, what, anybody else, what, would y'all, what do y'all like to do? Fun things, right? We, we want to have a good time. Uh, maybe uh, get out and just enjoy the sunshine. Go to the beach and walk up and down. Uh, pick up seashells. There's all kinds of wonderful things that we can do. But I want to talk to you about uh, sometimes we don't get to do what we want to do. Or we shouldn't just go do what we want to do. What if you had a friend who was sick and uh, needed you to go get him some medicine or needed you to help do something uh, really, really important and you had already planned to go to the beach or go fishing or uh, go out and, and uh, do something fun. What do you think Jesus would want us to do? Go do what we wanted to do? Or maybe put aside what we wanted to do and go and help the one that we know that is in need. And in, in our Bible story today, Jesus talks about uh, taking up a cross and, and following him. And that really means choosing to do what God wants us to do, even in those times when we really would rather do something else. And that's not just for kids, that's for all of us. Uh, sometimes we'd all rather do something else beside maybe go to church or uh, to be involved in, in something in the community. We'd a whole lot rather kick up our heels and, and watch TV, uh, do nothing. Uh, but if we're following Jesus and listening to his words and doing what he tells us, then we're not always going to do what we want to do. We're not always going to choose fun. Uh, we're going to choose doing what God would have us to do. And ultimately, uh, that's the best choice that we can make because God will fill our hearts and fill our lives with a joy and a peace that we can't find anywhere else. Let's take a moment and thank God that he loves us enough to call us to do things to help those around us. Lord, we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to always follow you and listen to your voice. And please, Lord, we pray that you would help us to always listen and truly follow your voice, even when it means that sometimes we might have to do something uh, that we would rather not do. And we thank you that you are with us at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we come to a time of prayer. And out there where you are, whether it's in the sanctuary or from home, you may have uh, a need that you'd certainly like people to be praying for you. And uh, as far as the... Uh, uh, sanctuary family in here, if, if you have an unspoken, would you just lift up your hand? The rest of us can see you. We'll know to pray for you. And uh, we don't even have to know what this need in your life is all about because we have the comfort of knowing that our Savior knows. And that's, that's all we need to know. Uh, 
just a few names that I would like to share with you. Uh, Ruth Ellen had a phone call yesterday from a gal that's like a sister to her in Richmond, and her brother died, and uh, this was like a brother to Ruth Ellen, and uh, he had just had a new kidney, and uh, there were some complications not really related to the new kidney, and after all this fighting and success to have something like this happen. So uh, the family of Depp Hancock uh, could certainly use your prayers. Uh, Brother uh, Ed Taylor, who used to be pastor at Regalwood Baptist Church uh, and has moved to Arcadia Baptist Church in Florida, uh, was taken to the hospital yesterday. His O2 levels were down, and he had COVID. Uh, so Ed and his wife, Deborah Taylor, we certainly would like to keep them as well as his church family in our, our prayers. And uh, meanwhile, back here at home, Rebecca Yates is out of the hospital, and she is now in Shoreland. She's in room 307, if anyone would like to reach out to her. And uh, we certainly would like to continue to remember Barbara Laramore. Uh, there are others, and the needs are numerous. But isn't it wonderful that we worship a God that handles all of these and treats them as if they're the only ones that matter? Let us go to our Father in prayer. Most gracious Lord, we come now and we humble ourselves before you and we draw near to you and are encouraged by the promise that the other half of that verse is that you will draw near to us. We know that you have read the concerns of our heart, those hands that were raised, those that are listening in on some other form to this service. They have needs going on in their lives and they, they reach out to you to please answer them. Lord, there are a lot of needs on our prayer list. All of us are praying. We're sharing needs that are written there or written in our heart or some that have just come to us. Along with those that I have shared, we take all of these requests and lay them at your holy feet. And we ask you to answer them and we realize that it will be according to your will and in your way. Lord, we also pray that our lives will be in accordance with your will and your way. We ask a blessing upon Brother David as he will soon come and share the message. And we ask prayers for this church and its ministry, and your people. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we come to that time in our service where we have opportunity to return uh, a portion of what God has entrusted to our care. Uh, we thank you all for your faithfulness and those who uh, continually each week have uh, mailed their offerings in, and we certainly appreciate that. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful and thankful for so many things that you provide for us that we just take for granted every day. And Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity you give us uh, of worship, and in this time of worship, the opportunity to exercise stewardship over those material possessions you have trusted to our care. We pray, Lord, that as we bring our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings, uh, that you would bless them uh, to the building of your kingdom, both in our hearts and in your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joyce, I'm using the CD today.
but I appreciate you being ready for me. For what earthly reason would the heavenly Father send down his Son to suffer rejection and pay for crimes he had not done? For what earthly reason would the Father let him hang on a tree? I wept with the answer that one earthly reason was me. I was the reason that one earthly reason. I was the guilty he was the sacrifice I was the taker he was the giver dying while I go free that one earthly reason was me the fairest of angels were not summoned from his throne up in the sky to purchase my pardon not even the angels could die the only provision for my freedom was destined to be that sweet lamb of glory and his only reason was me I was the reason that one earthly reason I was the guilty he was the sacrifice I was the taker he was the giver dying while I go free that one earthly reason was me it was me that one earthly reason was me. Thank you so much, Dave. We certainly appreciate that uh, wonderful anthem this morning. Our scripture text comes from Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Mark 8, 31 through 38. Let's stand together in honor of the reading of God's written word. 
He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, uh, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. May the Lord bless to our hearts and to our minds this portion of God's written word today. Thank you. you may be seated. Actually, now it was a number of years ago uh, when uh, the uh, TV program Good Morning America was on. It was back in those days when uh, Madonna was really uh, very one, uh, right at the very f uh, foremost of everything. She was number one in the music world, and uh, they were having an interview, and uh, it was so long ago that Charles Gibson uh, was interviewing a jewelry designer, uh, and this woman was marketing a new line of crosses that were being, uh, uh, I guess, sort of promoted by Madonna. Uh, the crosses were labeled the Madonna Cross. Among other things this designer said in the interview was that Madonna has brought a new dimension to the cross. Never has wearing the cross been more popular than today. And Charlie Gibson challenged that statement by saying he understood that the cross was an ancient Christian symbol that had been around for 2,000 years. Not anymore, said the jewelry designer. It's a fashion statement today. No one wears the cross for religious reasons anymore. Well, Gibson continued to challenge her, but she insisted that the cross was simply a current trend of the day. Think about that. That's certainly a depressing thought. For many people, it is true that the cross is just sort of a, a decoration. And that's sad in spite of our culture's shift with the cross. Uh, we need to take a few moments and examine the real meaning of the cross, the cross of Jesus. The story takes place just outside of Caesarea Philippi, which is a village that's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And there Jesus had gathered his disciples around him, and they could tell by the seriousness on his face that what he had to say wasn't easy, and so he started to tell them uh, the evil and awful things that were a part of the reason why he had come to this earth. He told them that he would have to suffer at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that he ultimately would be killed. But after he was dead, he would rise again three days later. And of course, this made Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, furious. He took Jesus to the side and began uh, to say, hey, that's not going to happen as long as I'm around. And Jesus said strong words, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in your mind the things of God, but merely human concerns. No doubt, Peter was stunned. Jesus had never spoken to him like that before, but Peter didn't realize how difficult this was for Jesus. Jesus called all those around him along with his disciples and said those very powerful words, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. Certainly, if he did not have their attention prior to that, he had their rapt attention in those moments. Jesus looked each one of them in the eye almost and said, what good is it if you get everything in this whole world, but you lose your soul? What was he saying to them? That to deny yourself and take up your cross 
Well, as we try to understand exactly what that means, we need to understand what it doesn't mean first. Uh, uh, in, in our world and in our time, we hear uh, folks who are going through any kind of adversity, and uh, they will say, well, I guess it's just my cross to bear. Uh, as I said, probably one of the most abused phrases on the planet. Uh, people can't get their fingernails to grow right, and they say, well, I guess it's just my cross to bear can't get their children to behave the way they want to and well I guess it's just my cross to bear I can't get their husband to quit snoring well I guess it's just my cross to bear Robert C. Morgan tells about a woman who had a rattle in her brand new BMW and she took it to the auto mechanic and after several tries it was still there and as she pulled out she said well I guess it's just my cross to bear my friends bearing a cross has nothing to do with simple things like that uncooperative nails and unruly children or a snoring husband or a rattle in the dashboard of your new car but there are three truths to consider about bearing a cross first deals with a choice second is self-denial and third is commitment you see denying ourselves and taking up a cross is a choice that we make it is not something that's forced upon us. It has to do with discipline and hard work. It has to do with uh, unselfishness and committing ourselves to what is best, not what is easiest and the most comfortable. It has to do with forgetting ourselves and concentrating on the needs of those around us. It has to do with a commitment to excellence in all things. And in short, in these few words, Jesus summed up all the helpful advice from all the self-help books ever written. People who succeed at almost anything in life are those who are willing to deny themselves. That's true, you don't get to be the best at anything by just simply doing what makes you feel comfortable. You do it by sweat, you do it by effort, you uh, sit at your computer or your designing board or your blueprints or your lesson plan or your practice schedule and you do it long after everybody else has gone home. You stay there in that sense of denying yourself comfort, denying yourself the ease, doing what is required to do the hard work. Some of you are baseball fans may remember uh, an old guy now by the name of Cal Ripken Jr. Ripken entered the sports history books when he played a record 2,632 consecutive baseball games, and that's a major feat. In fact, most players miss a game here or there because the baseball season is usually long. Uh, there's all kinds of injuries, and, and sometimes folks, even the best athletes, just simply get tired. Ripken didn't get injured less than any other player. He didn't need less rest than anybody else. But he earned national respect because he played on in spite of his injuries and his exhaustion. As he once said, I want to be remembered as an Iron Man, a player who went out there and put it on the line every day. I want people to truthfully say they couldn't keep him out of the lineup. Certainly that was the effort that he displayed uh, for, throughout his entire career. There's an Austrian concert pianist by uh, called Arthur Schnabel. And Schnabel was diagnosed with neuritis in his hands, and he referred to it simply as an occupational disease. He said other famous concert pianists would have agreed because throughout my entire stay uh, in Copenhagen, I played the, uh, the piano uh, through the pain. Uh, not concerned that my fingers were hurting, that uh, they were often inflamed uh, from playing so much. I played on. Yes, I'm very tired and my hands hurt, but they hurt because I'm striving to be the best that I can be. And that's true in every endeavor, isn't it? One of the most promising areas of medicine today is gene therapy. In fact, we all just sort of know what that is, even though we don't technically know what it is. But it was a, once an experimental technique, a technique of using genes to treat or prevent disease. And certainly it's uh, helping doctors in so many ways uh, in this day to understand how to, uh, to treat disease and uh, to uh, bring health back to their patients. And it's a, a promising uh, uh, option for all kinds of diseases. 
yet it's still and sometimes uh, uh, looked upon as, uh, as, as still being sort of experimental as they're still learning what to do. But uh, the uh, one who is known as the father of gene therapy is Dr. French Anderson. Dr. Anderson's been talking about gene therapy since he was a senior in college. And when he was talking about it, it was a radical idea. And he got first excited about it when at his senior year as he was at Harvard. He was attending a graduate seminar of doctors and senior graduate students. And there was a session on protein hemoglobin and the pigment in the blood. And at the time, he was doing research on putting genes from one uh, bacterium to another and watching to see what uh, properties changed. And so in the midst of the meeting, he raised his hand and he said, why can't we simply do that in a human body? Why couldn't we treat, say, sickle cell anemia by using a gene to create a normal hemoglobin? And the scorn and ridicule that was in the room as he asked this question, he said, was obvious. In fact, the leader of the seminar said to him, this is a serious scientific meeting. Don't be silly. Don't bring up science fiction. And so the future Dr. Anderson hid in a corner. And when the meeting was over, he was trying to sneak out. But one of his professors, Dr. John Edstall, one of the great names in science, came up to him and patted him on the shoulder and he said, that's an interesting idea. That's all he said. And he left. And he thought to himself, if Dr. Ed Edsall thinks this is an interesting idea, then I'm going to continue to pursue it. And on September the 14th of 1990, Dr. French Anderson saw the first fruits of his efforts. His four-year-old patient, Anishathi De Silva, received the first treatment using gene therapy. The young girl had a defective gene causing her to suffer what had been called the bubble boy syndrome. Uh, she was allergic to everything. And through this breakthrough treatment, Dr. Anderson was able to transform her life, give her a normal life. In fact, today there are many patients who have been helped through that work through the years. And the therapy is certainly continuing to have great promise uh, for those uh, who uh, are uh, still suffering from all kinds of diseases. But Dr. Anderson hadn't made the contributions he made through half-hearted effort. He could have simply listened to the people in the seminar that made fun of him when he brought up his question. He could have walked away when his critics turn, uh, termed his efforts and his thought science fiction and silliness. But taking up a cross has to do with being so dedicated to a cause that we are willing to endure criticism willing to endure persecution, willing to devote long hours in pursuit of a higher calling. The people who succeed most in this life are those who understand what denying themselves is, is about. And when Christ talked about his followers denying themselves and taking up a cross, he was talking about people who are willing to make more than simply a token effort. He was talking about people who are willing to give their all to follow him. Believe it or not, we still have people around the world who are willing to give it their all. Many who have made the ultimate sacrifice on behalf of a common good. And we really don't have to look very far to find such heroes. Of course, one example that we all can easily relate to are the firefighters who rushed into the collapsing Twin Towers back on 9-11. With no regard for their own safety, they were there to save other people who were trapped. Many of us will never forget the feelings that swept over us as we saw the Twin Towers crumble. Folk singer Tom Paxson wrote a song about it in which he called The Bravest. Some of you remember it. The first couple of verses go like this. The first plane hit the other tower right after I came in. It left a fiery gaping hole where offices had been. We stood and watched in horror as we saw the first ones fall. Then someone yelled, get out, get out, they're trying to kill us all. I grabbed the pictures from my desk and joined the flight for life. With every step, I called the names of my children and my wife. Then we heard them coming up from several floors below. A crowd of firefighters with their heavy gear in tow. Then Paxson sings that haunting chorus. Now every time I try to sleep, 
I'm haunted by the sound of firemen pounding up the stairs while we were running down. That says it all, doesn't it? Pounding up while others were fleeing for their lives. There's still people today willing to give their all. The heroes of 9-11 are but one example, but they're not alone. We see it played out even in daily life situations back even in 2012 when, uh, two, when six teachers were killed uh, as they stood between a gunman and their children. Sadly, they lost their lives, but they saved the lives of so many of their children by lunging at the shooter in an effort to stop that senseless massacre. Of course, we see it played out every day uh, in our military, in places all around the world, uh, even as we see it now with those who are on the front line of the battle against COVID. Uh, people who are willing to put it all on the line to help those around them in need. And folks, that's what Christ was talking about. Brian Chappell tells a tragic story that happened in his hometown. Two brothers were playing on the sandbanks down by the river. One ran up after the other a, a, a large mound of sand, but as they got on the sand, they realized that it wasn't solid. Uh, that it was kind of like quicksand, and they, their weight started them to sink, and the boys uh, did not return home for dinner. The family and neighbors organized a search, and they found the younger brother unconscious with his head and shoulders just barely sticking above the sand. And when they cleared the sand to his waist, they said, where's your brother? And the boy said, I'm standing on his shoulders. The sacrifice of his own life for his own brother, a tangible sacrifice lifted the younger boy to life and safety. Certainly an example a pale example of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. Jesus, of course, was addressing those special people who would be his followers. Many of those people who heard those words and were no doubt startled ultimately made that complete and ultimate sacrifice, dying as martyrs in far-flung places all around the world. Certainly, Jesus calls us to a higher calling, and the higher calling requires a greater sacrifice, but it has indeed the greatest and most significant award that we can ever find. And we, our lives will be brought to fulfillment that we will experience the presence and the blessing of God. How do we evaluate our lives? Are we focused on what we want to do all the time? Is that our number one priority, our comfort, our pleasure? Or are we aware of those around us who have needs that would require of us some of our time and some of our talent if we are aware of those folks and we respond in the name of Christ we are indeed denying ourselves taking up our cross a cross of sacrifice and a cross of service but it's always our choice isn't it Jesus summed up the whole matter like this what do you gain if you get the whole world and lose your soul Let's choose the choice that God would make us, would have for us, that we might receive the blessing of his presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can turn to you and know that no matter what the decision, no matter what the circumstance, that you are always there and that you are always leading us and guiding us if we would but pay attention. And Lord, this day we pray that in each of our lives, in each of our life circumstances, that we would be attentive to your voice, that we would make those choices that would bring us closer to living like your son, Jesus Christ. For it is in and through his name that we offer this prayer. Amen.
closing hymn, I'm going to sing a couple of verses of the hymn, Where He Leads Me. Let's stand for our closing prayer. As we're standing, would remind those of you of the uh, brief meeting of those who will be working with our children's church uh, right up here on, on these pews to my right and then uh, also to our deacon group of our meeting. And Ken's got a... Oh, okay. So everybody come on down. All right. Sounds good. Let's bow for our prayer of benediction. Eternal God, we are grateful for this day. The gift and the opportunity of worship has blessed our hearts and our souls and now we pray that as we leave that we would go and be a blessing in the places of responsibility that you have given us and serve you in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you so much and go in peace.